thoughts on the Micro 4.3 versus CMOS versus full frame, et cetera? Now that's a discussion. Who wants to take each sensor? <laughs> uh, can, I, can I take a stab at just initial response to get it, get it going? So when I, I went to school for photography, I'm a photographer, I wanted to get into video and I bought the GH4, Micro Four Thirds. So I went with Micro Four Thirds, but I had a Canon 60. I still own it. That camera is magical for photography and it's full frame. The GH4 that I upgraded to GH5, phenomenal camera, right? I mean, 4K 60, it's got, it, it's got all the bells and whistles and there's benefits to the Four Thirds sensor. Like I threw a 100 to 300 millimeter lens on that thing and I was like, you know, FBI agent <laughs> filming people <laughs> like a 1200 millimeter equivalent lens. Um, so, but I always struggled because I knew full frame so much that I got so much light and everything I do is low light. I never bring lights. It's all natural light stuff that I do. So I struggled with the low light. Uh, someone mentioned they own the uh, full frame S, S uh, one, right? Yeah. Reed, right? Glenn? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I thought about upgrading to that, um, but I have so much Canon glass. So I think the question also comes down to not just the sensor, but what type of work are you doing? Do you really do a lot of low light? Do you really need the, you know, 35 millimeter or a, you know, full frame sensor? Or can you get away with the micro four thirds? Because it's really a fantastic system. I mean, it, it really comes down to what are you going to use it for? You yeah. Know, like, how are you going to use it the most? And just general rule of thumb budgeting, micro four lenses are cheaper than super 35 lens and super 35 lenses are cheaper than full frame. It's a, it can get be pretty wild scale when you get to that higher end. Yeah. yeah especially depending on what system you go with, because micro four thirds, obviously there's, there's hundreds of lenses out there. Lots of different manufacturers make them. But when you go to something like the, L mount with the S series from Panasonic, you know, there's not a whole lot of lenses out there. And so if you want a good lens, you're going to pay a lot for it, but you know, it really comes down to, to what's your budget, what, what kind of, uh, you know, system do you need? What are you going to be using it for? You talked about lenses too. And when I got the GH, the GH5, I was big, like Canon FD lens shooter. And I actually have my 50 millimeter 1.4 on my R5 right now. But this was my setup with my GH5 for like two years. Is that an FD That's, lens? This is an FD. Yeah. Those are fun. Yeah. So, and it's D clicked, you know. Sweet. Um, but that was, I read an article. I remember there was a guy that was like all about FD lenses with the GH5. He had a whole website. <laughs> and I was mad. But I learned so much about it. And it was so fun to buy vintage lenses and adapt them. And that's a benefit of the micro four third system. And now mirrorless uh, being able to adapt, you know, vintage lenses. Yeah. Cause I use quite a few FD lenses on my full frame and my micro four thirds. So it's cool to have a system that you can swap lenses back and forth and be able to use them across the board. Yep. I mean, people don't realize how important the glass is versus the camera. You know, yeah. A lot of people put more emphasis on the camera body when in actuality, if you, you know, you, you, you use a vintage lens, it's going to look amazing. It's going to look like something that no one's ever seen before. And there's a reason why lenses cost more than the frame body, you know, than the actual <laughs> body. So, yeah. Yeah. and they hold value forever. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like, it's a weird investment because it's one of the few things after a certain point, the lens goes back up higher than it was when you bought it. If you hold it long enough, if it was a good piece of glass. Supply and demand, because people can't yeah. get it. It's like, oh, who's got a, and now you've got a high demand um, and now you can charge more for it because um, there's not many of them around. Oh yeah, some yeah. of those old, old weird Russian lenses that cost nothing oh, when yeah. they're made. And... <laughs> those are, those those old... they look amazing those anamorphics and the, all the weird adapted ones that you can find now that probably cost 50 bucks when they were out. Cause they're, they were like kit toy lenses to them at the time. Right. And now, yeah. That's where we should probably stop talking about them because the word's going to get out and they're all going to be gone. <laughs> <laughs> but, but 
now I you mean, can... I did that when I got my, I've had, I have a red dragon, but I started with a red one, but I mean, I have a PL mount when there's a budget, but I bought a whole set of Nikon lenses like 10 years ago. Mm. And so when I do small stuff, I put my Nikon mount on and I mean, I bought everything from fisheye to 400, like Whoa. lenses yeah, because they don't, they were like $300 on eBay and I put a gear on and just made a system. So it sort of works. Jackpot. Um, but then I, I know like now, I don't know how they are, but you can get these Chinese DZO lenses for like a thousand a piece. I'm Dude, kind of curious how good they are. I just um, tested, I had four on a shoot. I had the two kits of them and they perform. I had them on actually on the 12 Karis's and they're shockingly good. I had them outside. Um, both Most of the shoots were outside and we ran them on Ronin 2 and Ronin 2 and a Movi, one of each. And then one was on a slider, one was on a, I don't remember where the fourth one was. I think there's another Ronin or something. They look great. The the 20 to 55 all the way out though, the edges are really a little wonky. So once you get a 22, it worked really well. But the primes, are you used to the zooms or the primes you tested? I was using the, I was using the new zooms, the the, okay. two, the set, the 22 to 55 and the whatever. They do. Yeah, because they have a whole set of primes that looks really yeah, good. So I think they're full frame as well. Okay. So and that's for like $8,000, you can have a complete set of prime lenses, like seven lenses or something. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, so if like... you put the whole thing together, you can get a, a Komodo, a set of lenses. I mean, you get a Komodo with like a PL mount and those lenses, mm -hmm. and you can get a Liz M1 Mac Mini to run Da Vinci. Yeah. And for like, you have a complete studio that's just about the same quality as a big Hollywood production. And that's pretty amazing. But the size of the sensor does change what you can do. The larger sensor gives you the opportunity to have selective focus better than with the smaller chips. There's, there's no question. I mean, you just, yeah. you pick up a 1DX or one of these other cameras and you, and I, I mean, another thing, I'm, I'm an older guy. I mean, I grew up with a Nikon 35 millimeter camera and I know what a 50 millimeter lens does. Yeah in full frame and i've always had to like have my mind go create like okay what's the what's the factor for this one How do yeah. I make, you know so a 50 is a 35 right okay so an 85 is a 50 so um you know if you're doing <laughs> portraiture with a regular with a full frame lens a 50 millimeter and 85 millimeter or a 105 are the the ones to go to and that's that's how my brain works today yeah. And um and the background goes really nicely out of focus at a at a two and a four. I mean, yeah. and things are still sharp. I mean, everybody everybody um speaks so highly of that Leica pop on still on still photos. The Leica pop part of it is depth of field and, and having having the subject and the eyes being in focus. You know, so great camera. I don't know you. Everybody else has opinions about full frame versus Super 35, for instance. I mean, why should I get one over the other? Now, the focus gets very hard. If you're doing like a steady cam shot on full frame, one four, I've done this. I was on a TV show. They were doing that. You better have a really good AC because yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really tough. And they usually bring all the stuff now, light ranger and everything, because it's very difficult. And a wireless yeah. follow focus. <laughs> well, yeah, that's for sure. I mean, that's pretty much standard in the stuff I work. Everything is, I mean, when I, I've been doing this a long time too. So when I started, say we had to bring our follow focus, but now every, the stuff I work is just normal. Everybody has a Preston for every yeah. camera. And uh, I love it. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that again goes back to like what you're doing because, you know, if you are doing a lot of gimbal work, it's, it's probably best to go with a smaller sensor so you can keep everything in focus. <laughs> you know, but if you need to go wide often, it's probably best to go with like a full frame because you start to go with super 35 micro four thirds or something like that. And you go really wide, you start getting a lot of distortion, things like that. So it goes back to what, what are you doing with it? Yeah. I mean, micro four thirds in my, in my opinion, like running gun, it comes in super handy. Like if you're, if it's you by yourself, that's always a safer, I think a safer bet because it just, it's easier to keep it in focus. If you're just on a screen that big and doing it by the barrel, you only have so much. You might be looking at shoot stop video and thinking, so how does this all work? Is this about A, setting up the whole crew for me, B, just giving me options and having me handle it, or C, something in between? 
Well, it's D, all of the above. To put it simply, we're here to help you in any way that we can to get the crew and talent you need for your next production. We believe that every level of video production can benefit from a well-maintained list of qualified crew members for every position. This goes for pre-pro, on set, and for post. Every project is different, so if you need a producer to help manage the decision-making process, then we can totally do that. If you're already a producer and want to build your own crew from scratch, then go for it. We're here to make your next production a success. And if you are crew or talent looking for producers that want you, then you've come to the right place. Sign up now, and also leave a referral for any solid people that you know that are already on here. Thank you for considering ShootStop Video, and happy shooting!